Good evening. We're happy to have with us tonight uh, Chris Adams from uh, St. Peter's uh, Episcopal Church here in Washington. Uh, Chris is going to give the uh, invocation. Thank you all very much. I invite you now to pray as you are most comfortable. source of life found under many names, found also in the silence of our hearts. I'm not quite sure what to pray for. We have gathered this evening in the halls of our local government where decisions are made that will affect the entire fabric of our community. And it is indeed our community, a community made up of people from all walks of life, all persuasions and perspectives. Yet, in our gridlock, in our tribalism, in our partisanship, are we even able to grasp that any longer? Perhaps this prayer was called upon because many feel it is the right thing to do, to seek your wisdom, to seek your grace, to find in you a helper. Or maybe we pray to you to find a confirmation of what we already know, what we already believe. Do we ask you here as you are? an uncontainable God who cannot be controlled by our attempts to shape you into an idol of our making? Do we ask you here simply to do our bidding, unspoken as that desire may be? From the beginning of time, we have made war with one another, sometimes with weapons, sometimes with words, and often seeking your blessing upon the harm we do. We have been violent with one another in our actions, yes, but also through our government, as laws become enacted that hurt or harm. Perhaps then I do know what to pray for. What we need is not help to secure a victory for one party over another, but help to secure the well-being of all. May all of us tonight feel satisfied when we place the health and well-being of others over ourselves. May all of us tonight feel indicted when we allow ourselves to forget the faces of our neighbors in a pursuit of power or control. <coughs> tonight, may goodness and mercy be known in the halls of this board. May your wisdom be found. May graciousness, love abound. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank, Thank you very all. much, Chris. <clears throat> At this time, I'll call our uh, March uh, Board of Commissioners meeting to order, and I'll ask that you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and Commissioner Booth will lead us. Face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll ask that you silence your cell phones. Thank you. I just want to let you know that uh, Commissioner Revolts had surgery on his back. Uh, he's home recovering, and he would like to thank uh, people that have offered uh, prayers and uh, words of encouragement, and hopefully he'll be back uh, in April. Uh, we have our conflict of interest disclosure statement. Is there any conflict that needs to be noted? Okay, thank you. Uh, we're down to approval of the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would like to add to the agenda a discussion on the open meetings laws. I had this on the agenda. For some reason, the clerk didn't put it, see fits, put it on the agenda but there's some important information that needs to be discussed and some issues that this board needs to go over. Would you like to make a motion to add that? That is a motion, yes, sir. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Was it, was it, was it, was it, was it asked in a timely manner? It would be put on the agenda? I'm not aware of an, a discussion relating to open meeting. I asked an open. I asked for a closed. Oh session yes, sir. Yes, that it was. Has been denied, and I want a discussion of the open meeting. Yes, law. sir. It was. What? what so, 
So, the, so, so he didn't ask for the discussion of the open meeting law. He asked for the go in closed session. Right. Okay. Mr. Chairman, let's try to separate this into two different things. These are one in the same. The closed session is governed by the open meetings law. So if a closed session was denied, simple logic puts us to the open meetings law as being the issue. So a timely, requ a timely request was made. I was, under, I was under the impression that you said you, you made a, uh, a not to discuss open meeting law, but you had an item that you were going to put on the agenda. Am I correct? I asked for a closed session That's what of county commissioners. That is not on this agenda. I received an email from the county attorney with some palaver that we couldn't have a closed session. And I want to discuss the issue because I don't think it's been thoroughly looked at. Any other discussion? The, the real question is, is the subject matter that he asked to go into closed session, is that something we can talk about in closed session? And based on the opinion of our attorney and our county manager, it is not. Well, let me, let me go back to what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a closed session for the sheriff's department to, to give the commissioners information that they don't feel like needs to be made public. There's a lot of law that goes into this, and whether I ask timely or not, it doesn't matter. You can walk in here with no notice and ask for an item to be placed on the agenda. Timely doesn't have anything to do with it. Our, our rules and procedures do, though. Okay, all those in favor of adding the item to the agenda, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Gentlemen, okay. I will see you in the newspaper. Okay. I need a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor of the agenda, raise your right hand. Those opposed? All right. We're down to items for presentation. Uh, service awards. Uh, Dolores. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and, and Commissioners. We have two county employees here tonight uh, to receive their service awards. First of all, we have Mr. Milton Long with the Sheriff's um, Department with five years of service. And next we have Ms. Amy Spring with the Department of Social Services with 25 years of service. And we do have one more um, employee to actually acknowledge who could not be here tonight. And that is Ms. Jennifer Hudson with the Tax Administration Office. And she also has 25 years of service. So, congratulations to Jennifer as well. Thank you very much. We're down to the next uh, presentation is a cooperative extension update. Louise. I'm going to get a little bit of me first, um, unfortunately, and I'm having a hard time speaking, so I hope <clears throat> that, I'm, that it's, you can hear me. Um, several of you uh, have heard me come in and, and give an, an update on cooperative extension uh, over the last year or so, and we're trying to be more visible. Um, you know, two of our program areas you hear us talking about would be agriculture and 4-H. Those are very prominent, very visible programs. Um, again, riding down the road, you see agriculture everywhere. It's very important to our county. And, of course, youth programming is going to get a lot of attention. And so we're able to, uh, to um, get a lot of attention through those programs. The third programming area we work in 
is, through Cooperative Extension is our Family and Consumer Science Program. That one is a prominent program, but it's not as visible sometimes as some of the other programming that we do. And I thought it would be a good idea tonight to have Louise Hensley, our Family and Consumer Science agent, to come in and give you just a short update on the program that she's doing and some of the impacts that her programming has on the county. And I'll give you guys a uh, little bit of that while Louise starts. Thank you, Rod. I never want to be the, the dead link. <laughs> I think we're pretty visible, but you know there's always room to grow. Um, would welcome you all to the Beaufort County Center. We've got a, a little PowerPoint. Is it up? Can they see it? I can't see it. There we go. Thank you. Um, I wanted to welcome you to the Beaufort County Extension Center. Um, you all have made it a wonderful place for me to do my job. Um, we have updated the facility and it is an ideal place for de food demonstrations and culinary education to take place with some cooking classes. So I wanted you to see that today in, in this presentation. Um, I am Louise Hensley and I'm an extension agent here. I'm trained through um, NC State University to deliver educational programs. You have an overall brochure there that talks about family consumer science, primary focus, foods and nutrition education. Our, um, sadly enough, we all need to eat, but if you don't know who's cooking for you, you might not know what you're eating. And uh, we tell folks, um, if you want to be in charge and take control, you might want to learn to cook. So um, that's a, a great skill in culinary Cooking is at an all-time low in literacy in our country, so not just, just here in Beaufort County. Um, inside the center, this is typical of a classroom where I have folks sitting down, they're getting a little information to begin with in a class. And you can see I'm kind of hiding over there behind that counter, but we have television monitors similar to what you have here so that folks can see a PowerPoint presentation um, and get the information. They have written information in front of them. And then as our class moves on, we can I can do demonstrations up front and that camera has nine presets so we can zoom right in on the action and they can see up close what's going on sitting right in their, in their pew so we don't have to all get up and run, run, run from one place to the other. But they're going to need that information because in my classes I turn them from learning to doing because that's the old 4-H method and that's what I still do as an extension agent. So they're catching on, they're watching what I'm doing to demonstrate and then in a few minutes they're going to get up and move. But you can see this camera can zoom right in, that's a food processor, we're making homemade salad dressing in, uh, in this particular lesson. And let's see, once again they can see what's on the tray, they can see the ingredients up close. Um, makes, make, they're just raving over it, everybody's enjoying being able to see. This is what I have them getting, get up and see. Uh, we have actually put some PVC pipes underneath those tables to raise them up. Pretty simple, simple task. Make some countertop height. Suddenly adults aren't breaking their back to actually learn to cut with chef knives. And 85% um, and of all cutting in the kitchen should be done with a chef knife. So we're teaching those skills. People are enjoying um, gaining some new skills. So it's a lot of fun. Um, once again, they're watching the, watching the demonstration, seeing what's happening, and this equipment can move around. Um, this is what I see. I see the one center screen so that they can, I can see what they're seeing on either side. So this is showing a right left and then the center one to be that I can, I can see what the audience is looking at. We also have, um, when we've made the food and we brought it up front, we can set it up front. And we uh, do taste testing in my class. If you're going to cook, you get to eat. Um, so we're, we do talk about sanitation. We put on aprons. We do all the things right so that we all feel good about eating the food that we prepare. This is actually a grain bowl meal. So we're talking, there's some leafy greens. Then there's some grains, whole grains, some beans. It could, kind of goes into a, more of a salad bar after that. But um, really teaching some good nutrition information and it's been a big hit, been a big hit. So these are folks lined up going through the, um, the buffet, so to speak, and it's a very colorful meal. We make sure that not only are we feeding something that's nutritious, but it is delicious and people will replicate that. What they have tasted and tried, our research does show they will repeat. So we're, we're uh, kind of take on some ownership, but very colorful. 
Um, what do you see those appliances? We've got a new refrigerator, um, which is ideal for demonstration purposes. It's up where I can, don't have to bend over and turn too far, upside down to get into for, um, and has great storage. We teach folks about having that at 41 degrees at home. Um, this um, hood on this particular um, oven is very quiet. So we can run, um, run it and people can still hear me talking. Um, and we have a double oven, so we didn't need more space. But we have, um, and you can see, we can, we can do three trays of things at the time to do a large capacity of cooking within what looks like a home kitchen. We're not teaching industrial cooking here. So we didn't need an industrial kitchen. We needed one that would look like somebody's home. Um, very quiet dishwasher. It also has that sanitation uh, higher step on it, and it, it runs a very good, clean, clean one. So I wanted to thank you for, for helping make this a great space and helping with your funding for such and let you know you're welcome to register and come to a class that we have. I have a couple of quick little videos. They're just seconds long to kind of show you, re reiterate one more time, how this, how this kind of works in a classroom. You can kind of see from the, the scan of this going across how it's all, all happening, just to give you a little, little more action view where people can, can actually see, uh, see me teaching and can, can see from their perspective of these television screens to, or monitors, we call them, so that they can see what's happening on the, on the trays. It's about over. So it's a really wonderful, we've also got a, a new PA system, so I've had some folks to be in my class that had a little hearing trouble and they can hear me now with the portable PA, which is wonderful. And then this clip's really showing you those grains, but showing you I can, we can put um, this stuff right on the monitor so folks can see that far away. The camera moves, it's got a, a lot of great action. That's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Is any what? Yeah, Randy's got a question. He wants to know when he can go. <laughs> Is there any way this could be packaged uh, and and shown on our channel five? Would love it. Uh, Rachel Ray, I am not. <laughs> and I tease that because during this pandemic we made a lot of videos and tried to get information out to public because we couldn't gather. And I do do some video clips and things. To watch a whole class, which is two hours long, on video is pretty yuck. Uh, I think you'd be bored to death and folks wouldn't enjoy it. So when we make them concise and we edit and we can chop down, it just takes a little more time to make those. But by all means, we would welcome that. Well, I mean, we've got the capabilities, and I'd love to see that happen uh, because uh, we can make you Rachel Ray. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a big one, Rod. <laughs> That's a big one. But thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did we have any public comment sign-ups, Katie? We did not, okay. Uh, and I don't see our senator or representative here. Um, we're down to items for consent. Is there any items that you would like to pull? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to pull item three, four, and five. Three, four, and five. And there's another item here that wasn't on the agenda, but it was handed out as being from the chairman, this list. It's, it's part of the discussion on Senator Perry's request, which is on the agenda. <coughs> All right. Yeah, it's on. All right, so we're going to pull three, four, and five. Entertain a motion to approve the consent items. Other ones? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of the consent items, raise your right hand. Those opposed? All right, we're down to items for decision. Uh, planning department, uh, yard waste grinding and removal. Uh, West. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. Hope you are doing well tonight. Um, 
come before you tonight with a request to award a contract for our uh, yard waste grinding and removal services down at the landfill. As we've talked before about this process, um, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality regulations allow Beaufort County to process and store up to 6,000 cubic yards of yard waste um, at any one time to operate under our current method, which is called a yard waste notification facility. This is not a permitted um, yard waste landfill or a compost site, but based on the, um, the, the amount of material that's received, it's called a yard waste notification facility. Um, since June of 2021, we've averaged a little bit over 2,500 cubic yards of material that has been received at the um, site per quarter. So we're, we're roughly five to 6,000 cubic yards um, in half a year. And uh, luckily, there have been no major storm events during that time period that have caused us to increase that amount. So we've, we've been able to fairly well stay below that threshold um, easily within the year. Um, so to maintain our compliance with the regulations, uh, we do have to grind and remove that um, material. We can't spread it like has been done previously, but to stay under the 6,000 cubic yards, it's got to be removed from the site. So in order to make that occur, we, um, we've been under contract and just recently expired. So we, on January 24th, we issued a request for proposals seeking bids from um, qualified contractors to do that service. Um, the RFP was advertised on the county website um, for approximately three weeks. And we also sent directly to several contractors that we knew uh, were call it qualified and may would be interested in bidding on the project. Um, only one bid was received during the process, and that came from Shavender Trucking, who was our previous contractor. Um, and they have responded that they could accomplish the service at a rate of $24.34 per ton. Uh, this would be a three-year contract with uh, the possibility of two additional one-year periods if both parties agree. And a couple of the items that we've added to this new contract, uh, there is a, the option, the, the um, there is a fuel sur surcharge that would implement if fuel prices go over $5.50 a gallon. So we've, luckily we've got a little bit of ways to go before we get there, but we're trying to plan for that down the road. Um, there are also provisions for an annual CPI increase. We cap that at 5%. And also, if the contractor is able to find a facility that will take the processed material and pay for that, the county will receive 50% uh, of those proceeds. Um, funding for this service is included in the current budget um, as we, we're going to have to do it regardless. So there is no additional funding that is required. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, questions of uh, Wes? I have one. Yes. Wes, uh, when, hopefully once we have our mega sites done on south of the river, north of the river, will we be able to spread at that point will be fairly, fully permitted in order so that we can spread the material or give the public access to the material? The current thinking has been, and the planning with the engineer has been to do the same we're doing now where it would be ground and removed from the site. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, the regulations that are involved with starting a compost site are extremely intensive. Um, there's you have to um, do stop. You have to do um, rows of the material. You have to turn the material. You have to monitor temperatures, and it's an extremely intensive process that would um, go far and above what we do now. Would it be more expensive to do it that way? I would hazard any guess. I would believe so. All right, We're, we commissioners are going to talk about that at some point, there, right? I understand. Okay. Thanks. I have a question. Yes, yes. sir. At the uh, at the site, uh, this is uh, of the White Post site where yes, this sir. is taken into. Is there an attendant there? Does the attendant that works for our contractor do they let people in and out? How do we measure how much stuff's coming in? We uh, there's a scale at the site. We have a scale attendant on site during public hours, which are Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday from eight to four. Um, people come in. They pull on the scale. They get weighed, they go dump their material, they come back across the scale and get weighed back out. There are contractors that 
have the ability through our department to come in after hours for public and other contractors who have signed up for access that they operate that there's a display outside so they write down their weights and leave a paper ticket for the scale attendant to then enter in and then we just run reports periodically to see how is much that is coming scale out. attendant paid by the county or is that through our contract That's through our contract okay I, with, with landscaping unlimited not this contract not this okay I don't know if you've been there uh, Commissioner Richardson since we've had the change but uh, I had a chance to go in there about maybe two months ago. It is really a nice appearance when you first go in compared to previously. Yes, the, unrelated to this contract, it is a whole lot better. Yes. Any other questions of Wes? Okay, got a motion to approve the uh, three-year contract. Is there a second? I'll second. Any more discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Off to T-ball practice. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next item is AOC IT upgrades. And you're going to tell us what AOC IT. I think we all know IT. Yes, sir. Um, good evening, Commissioners, and there are quite a few acronyms that I'll be saying today. Um, but I'll give a general overview of uh, the item that's presented on page 257 of your agenda book. As you can see, there's quite a bit of text and quite a bit of information there. Uh, but it's basically regarding work that needed to be done or needs to be done in our courthouse in order to support the judicial branch. Um, the North Carolina Administrative Office of the Courts, there's another acronym, NCAOC, the AOC um, Technology Division provides information technology services and solutions to support the day-to-day -day work of the judicial branch. Judicial branch, Superior Court, District Court, uh, Small Claims Court, District of Attorney, um, as well as Public Defender. North Carolina AOC currently has two projects which require exp expanded IT and electrical infrastructure within the courthouse and other county buildings. Interpretation of that is we need additional wiring in the walls in order to plug in IT equipment. Uh, there are two projects that AOC is currently working with, and you may be familiar with these. I uh, understand that they may have presented at a conference that was recently attended by commissioners, uh, the CRAVE project and then the WAVE project. Again, those are acronyms. CRAVE, courtroom audiovisual system, and WAVE wireless access system. I did not make up these names, I promise. Um, so the first one we'll talk about is the CRAVES uh, project. In February of 2022, uh, the county officials were notified by AOC personnel that they wanted to install a CRAVE system to improve court effectiveness by bringing WebEx into the courtroom. This would allow for hybrid and fully remote judicial proceedings to occur. Uh, AOC would provide the equipment and installation services to install the equipment, uh, but the county would be responsible for providing the new infrastructure. They requested that it be installed as quickly as possible. Staff worked with the county's IT vendor and electrical contractor to complete this work in October of 2022. AOC is currently scheduled to install the new equipment this month in March of 2023. The cost to date is $18,000 with an additional potential expense of $2,000. Uh, so a total for the CRAVE project would be $20,093. Then in October of 2023, North Carolina AOC personnel contacted county officials to discuss the WAVE project. Again, WAVE wireless access. If you look up at the ceiling just on the back side of the black camera, you'll see the uh, square white device that is a wireless access point so that's what's allowing people in the audience as well as yourself to hook your cell phones or any laptops up to uh, to be able to get out to the outside world so the AOC is looking to put in multiple access points just as that one is but it would only be on the AOC wireless network not be on the county's wireless network Again, the county is responsible for providing an expanded IT infrastructure to support the installation of the new wireless access points in three different buildings. Courthouse, 
the courthouse annex, which houses the district attorney's office, and then what we refer to as the Horn Building, which houses the public defender's office. The quote provided by North Carolina AAC to have their contractor install the infrastructure was approximately $45,000. However, working with, again, the county's IT contractor, staff estimates that we will be able to complete this uh, around $27,500. Looking at these two separate projects, um, again, these were things that were not included in fiscal year 2023 budgeting. Uh, so additional funding is requested for both of these projects. So that would be a total of $47,643 is requested uh, to be transferred into the uh, facilities maintenance budget. Any questions? Go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Are you telling us that every courthouse is going to have to do these upgrades? That is my understanding, yes, sir, that they are going to all courthouses and doing this. And, of course, this is things that started a few years ago when they realized the benefit of being able to go remote. Is it mandatory that, they, that the county have to do it? <clears throat> it is my understanding that uh, the requirements from the state is that we provide facilities to the judicial branch in order for them to conduct their work. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead. Where and uh, which account is this money coming from? Where are we going to get the money from to do this? The what is proposed in your agenda packet is that the money would be transferred from general fund balance into the facilities budget to pay for it the installation. Well, didn't we have, didn't we have a, uh, uh, another account for court facilities? Yes, sir. actually that's true. It is, it's fund 4160, which is a court facilities fund. Technically that is the, the budget line item that it would go in. Out but we had an emergency, didn't we have $100,000 in an emergency account? Some sort of we do have some funds in contingency. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. We can pull it from there if you choose. It's the same thing at the end of the day. The amounts appropriated contingency at the end of the year. Well, it stays inside the budget if we if we take it out of contingency. I'm happy to make it contingency. Move to approve. And take it out of the contingency. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any more discussion? All those in favor of the motion, uh, raise your right hand. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I see this is more content for Channel 5. You could sell ads. <laughs> okay, Brad. Brad's going to give us an economic development update. Yes, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, members of the Commission. I apologize for my uh, voice. I'm already suffering from pollen. I'm uh, over it already. But I um, appreciate this opportunity. I want to talk to you about a couple uh, items that we've been working on for the past few months out of my office. Um, First and foremost, we're very happy to report that the log jam has been broken with the Aurora Industrial Park funding. Um, we were very happy to receive uh, on the 16th of March, <clears throat> I mean of February, the um, uh, North Carolina um, Rural Infrastructure Authority approved a, an additional 500000 which paired with the original 750000 that was um, put toward this project back in 2019. So total amount coming from the um, North Carolina Department of Commerce was $1.25 million uh, to cover infrastructure for this cost. If you recall, this project uh, originally re originated back with the town of Aurora with uh, your board here uh, agreeing to loan the town of Aurora uh, the funds in order to purchase the property, contingent on their pre-selling 75% of the total um, amount of that loan. And so with, we are ready to proceed now. The, um, uh, when we put it out to bid, uh, the amount had gone way up. That's why we had to go back to Commerce for additional funds. Uh, we have also <clears throat> um, had ten, uh, tacit approval from the Golden Leaf Foundation. They are taking forward a $500,000 grant for infrastructure to support the Beaufort County Community College satellite facility that will go, will locate in the Aurora Industrial Park. And so uh, we hope to have that uh, approved at the April 5th or 6th is when their next uh, board meeting is. Um, 
We, they have previously supported that project to the tune of $200,000. That's helped with the engineering due diligence and site studies needed for the infrastructure extension for that. Um, we just today uh, had received the bids back for the project and happy to report that the costs have gone down since our bid back in, I believe it was October when we initially put it out. Um, so we feel like that costs have gone down considerably, uh, roughly $200,000 since our, we bid it in October. That's due to a variety of, of factors, not exactly sure, but we had the original um, Companies that bid on the project also bid on the project, so we're, we're happy that's uh, gone down. Um, we don't yet know what that final cost will be. We're, we're still kind of factoring all that in, but um, the, the path that Golden Leaf has chosen to fund this project is supporting the community college infrastructure needed for that satellite campus. And so we may come back to you at a, a later date to ask for specific support if we find there is a gap. But we feel very strongly that that gap is closed, if not completely, uh, as of today, uh, according to those, those bids that we got back. So happy to report that. You might have seen the news uh, had, had broken when we received those grants and uh, the town of Aurora got some great coverage and we feel very strongly that uh, in April once the Golden Leaf grant is approved we'll also have a chance to make a big splash around education and uh, that satellite campus coming back to the town of Aurora. Um, <clears throat> we have been actively involved with the Washington Warren Industrial Park uh, development. That is uh, part of the uh, $20 million that were, was given, appropriated through the General Assembly to the uh, Washington Warren Airport. Uh, we are having weekly meetings now with the airport director, Earl Malpas, to, to plan that, that um, development out at the in airport. Uh, we are looking for uh, additional grants that may be able to support that uh, development, including infrastructure development and, and possibly new property acquisition. We are targeting a number of grant opportunities, such as the Golden Leaf Site Program, uh, again, the North Carolina Department of Commerce Utility Account, uh, NCDOT Road and Aviation Division funds, as well as the North Carolina Department of Commerce Rural Transformation Grant. Um, we are very actively engaged right now with the uh, Beaufort County Industrial Park at Chocolwinity. Uh If you recall, I might have updated you before on this opportunity, but we have uh, been um, up, we have applied for a grant through the North Carolina Railroad Company, and we hope to uh, hear back on that in uh, here in mid March. Uh, they came back for a site uh, visit in January and evaluated our community and our site uh, with the with the goal in mind of uh, funding a grant that would help us plan clear and grade a, a development site and possibly help pay for some of the rail spur that would be needed to come off that Norfolk Southern line onto the site. Um, <clears throat> we also were, it, uh, part of the feedback that they gave us at that event was to, um, we needed to do a little more study of the wetlands there because of the uh, preliminary evaluation of the site showed that the, the parcel was very affected by the wetlands that were located on that site. So we've engaged a, a firm to study that and we hope to get that report back uh, very soon. And we'll pair with that the um, uh, grant that we'll receive from the North Carolina Railroad, hopefully, and um, then that'll give us a lot better idea of what is developable out there so that we can kind of maximize that for um, complete growth of that park that's been um, laying uh, in development for, for several years now, but we feel like we've gotten a lot of activity. Certainly, um, that bears uh, in my report in a second about the project activity that we got. That site has been our most submitted uh, site uh, lately for all the um, requests for information that come out of the state. So uh, we feel like once we get a little bit more information about the site, we'll be in a much better position to move forward with, um, with some of these projects. And we've already made cuts and we've, we've actually got some uh, interest in, in the site as we speak. Um, and we probably will also look at the due diligence studies for the Washington Beaufort County Industrial Park. That's where the Skills Center is located, uh, our offices currently. And uh, those studies are somewhat very old. And so we'll be updating that to up, you know, update the map sets and all of the studies that have been done there. Uh, but that, that also has been very active. And we've, we've had some offers and some, some interest in projects out there. 
Um, just as far as miscellaneous stuff, before I move into projects, we um, I've got a, a active project, which is uh, the next item on the agenda will be uh, for a, a new lease that would be necessitated by that project. Uh, we are actively working to reestablish the Beaufort County Economic Development Advisory Committee. We had a, a, a first meeting of that, and we're actively looking at the uh, bylaws to, to reestablish that standing committee. Um, we are also uh, dealing with several individual company referrals that we get from uh, partners in the community. Um, we have um, meeting regularly with our workforce development group and we are going to be going out to do some uh, company visits here in the near future. Um, in March here, I'll be attending the first meeting of the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. I'm, I've been uh, tasked with serving on their advisory council. Uh, we have uh, created a retail attraction group that's in partnership with the City of Washington, um, Beaufort County Chamber, uh, downtown, and we, we've actually had a couple of meetings with that group. <clears throat> I'm actively working with the town of Bellhaven uh, to study some of their uh, questions they have around Airbnbs and occupancy tax and how that's handled. And I'm happy to report that I'll be attending uh, with Electricities a mission trip to uh, Munich, Germany here in the next few weeks to uh, attend trade shows, <clears throat> visit private companies that have already expressed an interest in uh, relocating to North Carolina, and hope to visit uh, the headquarters of two of our German companies that we have here in Beaufort County. Um, site activity, project activity has been very robust lately. Uh, a project that we spoke about uh, a few months ago in, in closed session will uh, have a grant uh, that we'll be applying for uh, that will be announced uh, next month for that. So we'll be bringing that back forward to you. Um, that is a, an existing company that's expanding here locally. We also have another existing company that's expanding that actually wants to build uh, a new uh, facility in the Washington Beaufort County Industrial Park. And so they've made an offer and we're processing that and having the site um, appraised as we speak and hope to have that back before you next month. So that's a, a good project. Uh, a big one that was actually, uh, we're working actively, which is uh, another big reason why I'm here, is a project that has expressed a desire to rent the uh, skill center where our office is located. Uh, long term, they want to purchase um, 10.84 acres out at the Washington Beaufort Industrial Park to build their own facility, but that's going to take some time. And so uh, in the meantime, they want to uh, sign a one to two year lease with the Committee of 100 which owns that property uh, and then have a one-year renewal and then from there uh, they would plan and develop their new facility that they would build on campus. Uh, so we that would necessitate us to move out of the facility. Initially they would move into the office portion of the building and then later occupy the rear production section once the Beaufort County Community College's boat building program is finished on campus and they move out. So we'll, we'll discuss that in more detail next, but that's a really good project for us. Um, the, uh, we also have just this week had a, another interested party, uh, actually last week, that uh, is interested in uh, purchasing 5.74 acres for their project. Uh, so again, selling, we feel very strongly in the next few months we'll be uh, selling two or three parcels out there at the uh, Beaufort County Industrial Park in Washington. Uh, project, um, several projects out at the airport. Uh, actively engaged around that. Not quite yet uh, the industrial park side, but more so on the existing uh, hangar side. But we actually are, are working several projects there. Uh, actually, I'm uh, attending meetings in Raleigh tomorrow at the uh, invitation of Representative Kidwell, and uh, along with the airport director, just kind of talk about the economic development potential of that industrial park and all the things that we're doing here in Beaufort County. Um, I mentioned the Beaufort County Industrial Park, uh, very attractive uh, because of that rail and its location on Highway 17. We actually have a, a gentleman who has made an offer on some parcels of land. We're working through that right now. Uh, definitely want to perhaps uh, sometime soon in closed session uh, talk to you a little bit about those details and, and, and talk to you about that uh, request. Um, we are actually kind of waiting for the wetland delineation and the grant to be returned so we can move forward on that and really determine where the best available land is that we can hopefully facilitate this request as well as others. Um, 
Another project that's a, a pretty substantial project, we've made the second cut for that out at the Chocolate Indian Industrial Park. And literally just today, we had a, a $300 million project uh, looking uh, for rail serve sites in North Carolina that need 100 acres and would create 75 new jobs. So again, that uh, is a lot of activity around that site. So happy to report that. Um, that's kind of all of my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, before we move into the next agenda item. Questions? I, on the Aurora Industrial Park, because there's so many moving parts before anything can happen there, can, can you come up with the latest numbers as it relates to the sources of funds and then the sources of use? Yep. Uh, and I know that there's grant money and there's the sale of the lots. Uh, then the construction cost and the payback of our loan, uh, but it, it's it's changed quite a bit, and uh, I'd just like to see the numbers where they balance. Absolutely. In fact, I've got that mostly pulled together with just some uh, small updates needed to, to to be made, so I can get that to you this week. Okay. Absolutely. Any other? I have a question. Yes. Who is managing that project in Aurora? Um, well, it's kind of jointly managed. The town of Aurora, this is their project. So I'm giving assistance as much as I can, but they're actually the recipient of the funds. And so uh, we actually have engaged uh, the Mideast Commission to help manage that grant on our behalf uh, so that we make sure that we um, handle all public funds, uh, you know, very strict according to the rules and, and make sure that everything goes to what we, we had planned for it to go. Um, it's kind of a joint effort. Now that we've added the community college, they of course have a vested interest in this and they're actually the ones applying for the grant uh, through the Golden Leaf Foundation. And so uh, it, it, it's grown in scope and scale, but uh, we feel like we're, we're very close to the finish line with that project, at least the funding and then the, the funding. Who, who is the decision maker on the construction of the project. Who is managing the design and construction of the project? Yes, uh, we do have an, an engineer firm gauge, the East Group, Michelle Clements uh, at, with the East Group is the engineer on record who has managed the uh, design due diligence as well as the bidding of the process. But which public official are we going to hang if this thing goes south? Who is in charge of this? Well, I uh, I'd hate to throw Cliff Williams under the bus because he's been a great advocate, but I think the mayor, the uh, town of Aurora is the, the main entity, the lead entity between this, and we are supporting him, but feel very strongly that we're, we're going in the right direction. The money is, the money is going to flow through him, through the town of Aurora, is that correct? Yes, sir. So the town of Aurora is managing the project? I would say so, yes, sir. Okay. Hey, one more question on the Aurora project. Uh, since the community college is involved, will that particular parcel be deeded to uh, the county of Buffer? Be deeded to the community college. Yes. To the community college, which ultimately the county owns the real estate. If it were to ever go away, then yes. Right. I mean, okay. Just like schools. It comes All right. you. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Brad, I've heard you speak at the um, uh, Committee 100 meeting. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke of a affordable housing committee being formed. I was not aware of that. Is that going to be the uh, uh, Beaufort County? Yeah, that's this this task force that uh, the the Beaufort County commissioners have we formed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and again, we haven't met yet. Um, we've we've had an initial kind of scoping meeting um, that was open to the public, but have not yet had our first meeting. That was going to be my second question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, you want to move into your next item, Brad? Yeah, so uh, Pro Project Globe is the, the project that we um, ha has, has expressed interest and given uh, verbal uh, approval on their desire to rent uh, the entire office space that we currently um, rent from the Committee of 100 at our location on Page Road. And so in order to uh, facilitate that project moving forward and keeping them here in, in uh, Beaufort County, they would actually be relocating from outside of Beaufort County. So we're very excited about that. Um, we would have to find new office space. And so we uh, started asking around and we eventually found an office that's being newly renovated here in the downtown Washington area uh, that actually works out great for us as far as space needs. It's uh, 
really the, where we're at now is larger than what we need and actually served its purpose uh, very well over the years to allow us to uh, have a space for companies that want to set up shop in Beaufort County and work through that as they find their own facility and so um, the Committee 100 has been the uh, developer and landlord of that facility and so um, we have found an office space that we're very interested in and that's the lease you have in front of you. Uh, we um, feel very strongly that it's a, it's a good uh, rental rate as far as that we we really think we'll end up saving money in the long term in the near term uh, actually and um, we we don't yet know what those dollar amounts will be and, and some of it will be fairly static but we know for certain that the um, natural gas uh, utilities uh, will all go down in price uh, because it's a lot smaller area that we're going to be leasing and we hope to completely eliminate the landscaping fee because we're we're not uh, going to have to keep up up the, the grass and the mowing that we, we have had at the, uh, the other facility. So um, you have the lease in front of you. Happy to answer any questions about that and, and how that's going, but um, excited for this opportunity because it helps us land a, a project that is um, uh, at least 50 jobs coming to uh, Bover County. I, I raised a question um, this morning and Brian answered. If I understand it correctly, it, it's $12 a square foot. No, it's it's two thousand square feet and it's two thousand dollars a month, so it's a dollar a square foot for a three year lease. But on an annual on an annual basis it's twelve dollars a year. Okay. Uh, so you're getting two thousand square feet. No, normally these leases have a diagram of the of the premises that's being leased. I, I don't see anything like that here. Yeah, um, it's it's being uh, renovated as we speak. We don't really have a, a diagram per se. Um, I, we could probably pull that together for you relatively quickly. Um, it's a, it's a fairly shotgun style uh, shape of the offices with um, two, three private offices. Uh, co what we'll use one of those as a conference room, so one additional office as well as some room for uh, temporary workers like interns to work as uh, comp. Uh, along with um, break room and that sort of thing. Uh, all I want to know is before this lease is, is put together is that there's a diagram of what we're leasing attached to it that can be identified. So we know what we're leasing. So we're, we're leasing the entire building? No, that okay. didn't answer my question. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it's, I, I'm it's just a saying, legal, if you want to draw, if you want us to draw it out, we can certainly get rid of it. No, all of, the, all of the leases of this type that I have seen have a diagram attached to them so that you can identify what you're leasing because if you have a dispute or you go to court looking at this lease, what are we leasing? The entire address. Well, what's the mumbling on the other end down there? Um, 108 Union Drive is located uh, between right behind, right across the street from this facility, right behind the um, CenturyLink building. It's a, a for, I think most recently it was a church property. Um, so if you if you go right there, it's very convenient for obviously this meeting as well as all of our meetings at the county county office building. But it's it, the entire building. It's the entire it's building. building, and it's it would only, be that. It's only one story. It's only one story. And Unfortunately, one, judges don't understand that. You need a, some kind of a description that's a legal description of what we are leasing to go into this. My next question is. Will the lease with, uh, or the agreement, or whatever it is, with the Committee of 100 be, di be dissolved when this lease takes hold? Yes, sir. Yep, it will be. Um, so we will not continue to pay rent at more than one location. We will only pay rent at, at one location. Well, I, I want the lease legally dissolved, okay? The next, no the next question is, after the three years on this thing, when the Committee of 100 can't find anybody to go in their building or whatever, you know, our plans are not to go back out there, right? No, sir. This is, uh, is renewable for two additional three-year terms, and it is our intent to stay there um, permanently. Okay. Any other, any other questions on the lease? Entertain a motion. Did we have a motion? Okay. Is there a motion to accept the lease? Well, with the caveat that a legal description be added as to what we're leasing to the lease. That's part of my motion. Yeah, that's part of your motion. Well, this this is a standard real estate uh, lease agreement that's been approved by attorneys. And it's All got, due respect, there's no such thing as a standard lease agreement for real estate. It, it, 
it would have the uh, description, I mean, it's a building sitting on a piece of property, which is in here somewhere, I'm sure. Okay, did we have a second? Second. I'll, okay, second. All right, all those in favor of the lease, uh, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Five, 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 one. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect to the board, would it be all right if we insert Janelle Octagon into the agenda so that she can go ahead? She's the last one here. The rest of us that have to be here. And if we could go ahead and handle the consent agenda items that were pulled, she's here for those items. So if we could do that, that'd be I'd appreciate that. That's fine. Uh, Janelle? She just walked out. Did Hmm? Uh, obviously, we didn't plan that ahead of time. Okay. All right, the Janelle. Hey. This is on page 27. This is the health department vehicle surplus. We're talking about a 2009 Toyota Prius. Uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner Richardson. Well, my question with this Prius is for about $1,200 or so, I'm not looking at the paperwork, but in that neighborhood, and it's a low mileage car, we can fix it. My only question is, is you're surplusing it, which normally would mean to me that it's going to be disposed of by the county. Mm -hmm. But rather than buying another $30,000 vehicle somewhere, why can't, Mr. Manager, we use this vehicle to re in place of another vehicle somewhere within our system? If it were used, both health department would be using it. No, sir, you don't understand. No. For about $1,200, the car can be repaired. I understand, and, and the health department has said it's not worth it to do that. I think our folks agree with that. I mean, Janelle can certainly tell you about all the conversations they've had with the folks who work on this. The vehicle is, is beyond what it needs to be, so we certainly wouldn't waste money on it trying to get it to a point where it could stay for another few miles. Page 27. It's so what we were told was uh, it's, a, it's a new it's it's the first hybrid pieces that came out and it's 14 years old so it was new technology at the time and, and not new now. You just said enough to convince me. So it's battery and yeah get rid of, get rid of it hybrid hybrid hybrid. Okay. <laughs> Took care of that. Well. Okay, but that because it was pulled, we've got to have a motion. Would you like to make the motion? I'll make a motion that we approve item number three. All right, and I'll second that. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. The next one is the uh, document image conversion. Well, I understand that this $53,000, you know, cleans up a lot of the records and all that. My question doesn't go so much to doing that as how much more money do you have in the health department that from these ARPA funds that you haven't spent yet? Sure. So that would be the last of that fund or the imaging. This would be the last bit of that. So that would take care of that. Um, as far as the structure that we have to build it, I think we were given 147. So with that, you get under 90. We're looking to do the keyless entry for security purposes, uh, similar to the county. Um, we are looking at, what was the other thing? Training, because the ARPA funding provides a public health workforce training, implementation, preparedness, uh, recovery, those kind of things. There's actually about $30,000 worth of training there. Um, and yeah, that would get us down to there. I think, oh, I, I misspoke, I'm sorry. There's 30,000 that's TBD. So right now we have everything planned out besides 30,000. All right, let's be sure what we're talking about. Sure. You have no ARPA funds in any project other than what you just described. You're out of money in ARPA funds. So, well, okay. So the other one that you pulled, so you're talking about the 147,759 regional public health ARPA funding, correct? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm talking about after you do these two things here, after you spend this money, how much money do you have left that's been given to the county or available to the county in ARPA funds? Okay, so the only, the 53,000, the, what's the other request that you're talking about though? The 147,000 regional 
public health funds. Okay, so the 53 would come from that 147. Okay. Okay, and so then we have 10,000 for training. That has not been put forth yet. The contract, or excuse me, the AA that was just signed by Pitt County, this funding will it'll go till December of this year. Um, so this would be the first that we've spent of the ARPA, of this one from the regional ARPA funding. Maybe it's better to do this. Why okay. don't you go back and talk to your accounting people, mm -hmm. or these accounting people, or whoever, and let's see how much ARPA funds are remaining that are unspent that you have. Well, we haven't spent any, so 147759 All you had to begin with was 147000 Yeah, that was a contract that was just signed. I thought they, no, but, but before this, haven't you received ARPA funds? Yes, but I, this one that I'm referring to, I apologize if that's the confusion. I guess there is several ARPA funds. I'm talking about all the money you've got in ARPA funds. I don't care what you, when they gave them or whatever, what's available and remaining yet to be spent. Okay, then I will get that back to you because there is separate pots of ARPA. The money that was here is the regional ARPA that was That's distributed to us. Thank you. That's all I want. Sure. Okay. All right. Would you like to make a motion to approve this one? Oh, the other. Well, another question that I have. These are WIC, Hyde County WIC. Wait a, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's, let's oh, get. You want to stick? Yeah, with we need to get to 53. No, I got you. I move that we approve item number four. Okay. Second. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Okay. Now I'll go to the next item. The, the question, the, this uh, Hyde County WIC has always, uh, we're partnering with Hyde County? Yes, sir. So the state actually contacted us, and Hyde County was going to lose their WIC. So long story short is that if WIC was gone in Hyde County, the residents that were there would come seek us, and we would not have the financial support that we have by doing a subcontract with them. So this way we're able to serve their clients and get financial support for the services we would provide. We go down there and set up shop so many days a month or something? So right now it's by telephone. The goal is to go down at least once a month, and they have a space there, an office, that we would see their clients of. And the subcontract is with who? $7,300. Right. So that's what the WIC Hyde received or had less this year, and that's that subcontract. So we entered it in with Hyde County Health Department. That's income to Beaufort County? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And then the 147750 is another ARPA that's income to Beaufort County, and you've divided up how you're going to spend that. I have. And so it just so I'm correct with what I'm getting back to you is all ARPA funding, not regional, other, you want that breakdown. About every dime that you've got that you can spend, that's ARPA money. Okay. I can okay. do it. All right. I move that we approve uh, the item number five. Okay. And I'll second that motion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Anita, down to the finance report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to quickly update you on some sales tax numbers this evening for the finance report. I don't believe I've shared with you the November uh, sales. They actually slid down a little bit. You can see we had been collecting right at $1.1 million for the first four months of the fiscal year, and then it slid back to 958000 So the thought there was, you know, we're starting to see our sales tax maybe go back to something more normal. But as you can see, the very next month in December, we received our all-time um, distribution that we've ever seen at almost 1.3 million. So um, sales tax kind of continues to puzzle us a little bit. Um, we would expect the November and December sales to be high because those are our Christmas sales and they're historically our highest sales months of the year. Um, we do know that the extra pandemic funding available through the American Rescue Plan um, those subsidies that were being um, given to low-income families through DSS, those programs did end in February um, about a week ago. So it'll be interesting to see the impact on our sales tax. We do expect you know, our sales tax numbers to probably go down a little bit. My understanding from the manager, he was on a call where those additional subsidies were about $100 million throughout the state. Um, so you take $100 million out of the economy, and I, I think we'll expect some of our sales tax numbers to obviously go down. Um, but 
for the first six months, you know, we're up 11%, running a million dollar subsidy right now. It remains to be seen what will happen the last six months, but we're certainly tracking it and we'll keep you posted each month. Thank you. Any, any questions of Anita? All right, uh, Brian, the uh, poster, postage meter lease. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, you'll see that we currently lease our postage machine from Pitney Bowes, and as you know how postage machine work, postage machines work, um, they have to be approved by the United States Postal Service. You can't just get a postage machine from any and everybody. Um, so we currently use Pitney Bowes, uh, their machine, the lease on that ends April the 30th of this year. And they have advised us that that machine becomes obsolete after that time. That lease was 307.29 per month, and it did not include maintenance of the equipment. Um, we have tried to get a new quote from them. We were unsuccessful in getting that quote prior to the agenda being put together. Um, so we had had reached out to Quad, uh, Quadrant USA. They are a USPS approved vendor. They are covered under the North Carolina State Purchase and Contract pricing. Um, so you have a copy of their proposal. Uh, it is a 39 month lease at 253.99 per month with a one time activation fee of 295. That lease includes installation training, a barcode reader for certified letters, which will actually save us, and then on site maintenance. So it covers everything. The total fiscal impact is $10,200. 61 cent over that 39 month lease we have funds budgeted for that whether it's with them or with somebody else uh, but we would recommend your approval on that 39 month i move we approve the proposal is there a second second out of second any further questions or discussion all those in favor raise your right hand thank you you want to get to uh, the public beach and coastal waterfront access yeah. grant Yes, sir. Be glad to give you back up on some history. Back in April of 22, at a regular board meeting, the board uh, approved submitting a pre-application for this grant uh, to do the final phase of the Wrights Creek project. Uh, in September the 6th of 22, you held a public hearing on some before you submitted the final application. There were no public comments received, and the board approved moving forward with that application. And then October 25 of last year, the governor announced that we had received the the grant amount and the amount of four hundred and five thousand um, dollars the original match you may recall the original match on this grant was fifty percent but because we were combining that with a part of grant they were able to use some of those pieces as the local match so it reduced the local match to 307582 so it's not a 50 50 match um, you have included with this the uh, the project ordinance and the budget amendment which provides for the local match and this will complete Wrights Creek as originally proposed. The fiscal impact is 307582, um, and we would recommend your approval on the grant contract. Entertain a motion. Get a motion, a motion out of second. Uh, discussion. Questions. I just have discussion. So I just want to say one thing. This is a rat hole. When you're done with this, nobody's going to be happy. The soils are not conducive to what you're trying to use this project for. We bought a slimes pond that was worth $50,000 at the most, paid $400,000 for it. It's been, with the toe of the slimes pond dike washing away, uh, it's been one expenditure after another. We should have abandoned this project a long time ago, and I'm not going to vote for it. Any other question? A uh, couple comments. I, I went in my file and found a map, aerial map, and it was uh, wetlands uh, for CAMA major site plan. This was done in 2008. I was trying to get my arms around how long we had been working on this. Um, so it tells me somewhere in that 2008 is when we had the property appraised, which was both phase one and phase two, the real estate, as it related to the purchase. Uh, and then when it was purchased the second time, it was based on the original appraisal. Um, and uh, it says that uh, the wetlands on this particular block if I'm reading this right, is 1.37 acres. So it is, there is some. Um, in, in the construction and the plans, we've got somewhere around 550 feet of riffraff. 
is in is in the construction uh, to stabilize as you go out of the gut uh, back around it will start northeast and go kind of all the way around that point to stabilize it. that to my knowledge I've been out there a lot that's where we had the erosion and that should stop that so uh, I would like to see this project completed uh, it's been on the table a long time and uh, I'm hoping between now and in the next 12 or 24 months maybe we can get it completed so any any other questions comments After David finished, I got one more. any other go ahead okay where's the 300,000 coming from what pot so it come out of fund balance come out of, well so that's going to show up as an increase in the budget for this year yes that's why you have the, the project ordinance and the budget amendment associated with it yes so it, it will increase the budget okay all those in favor of uh, continuing and and finishing the project uh, please raise your right hand those opposed Let's see, Brian, the next one is uh, you also waive two yes, sir. opioid settlements? Yes, sir. This is what they're referring to as uh, the waive two opioid settlements. Um, you, you see in the agenda item that Department of Justice, North Carolina Department of Justice recently announced there are five new opioid settlements. That's with CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Allergan, uh, and Teva. Um, they result. They will result in an additional six hundred million dollars to North Carolina state and local governments. The distribution of these funds will mirror the original MOA allocation model that was um, under the first settlement agreement with opioids, which was signed in 2021. You have all the attached documentation, which includes an email from the NCACC about it. You have a letter from um, the North Carolina Department of Justice explaining it. You have a resolution, although you voted at the last meeting to approve it, there needs to be a resolution approved. There's some specific language in that resolution that needs to be approved that the association sent out. Uh, and then you have a supplemental agreement for additional funds called the SAAF that needs to be approved. Um, all those things have to be have to occur by April the 18th, or you lose that opportunity for funding. Uh, the county attorney has reviewed all these documents, and our recommendation is that you approve them. Is a uh, motion on second? Any questions? Okay. All those in favor of uh, the motion, raise your right hand. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, item number four, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. It, as you all, and I think you all received it. If you didn't, I forwarded it to you. Uh, Senator Perry, who represents Beaufort, Craven, and Lenore County, sent a letter of request to all elected officials in his district for any legislative changes, infrastructure items, or capital budget requests. Um, Senator Perry currently serves as one of the chairs of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, so what we are looking for is any direction from the board on items that you may wish for us to send to Senator Perry for consideration as they go through uh, the budget process. Each, each one of you should have a, a sheet in front of you. Uh, I put together three different projects that have been discussed and that we have some kind of idea or, of uh, the money involved uh, that uh, we could submit. Uh, the first one is update first responder radios. And Chris, you might help me uh, because you responded to this late this afternoon. Because I understand that the total that it's going to take to update everything is close to two million. If and we you, look at at all the all the components to the best of our ability to forecast and try to wrap our arms around that project, yes, sir. Uh, so our our work on kind of investigating that project um, kind of stems from several past initiatives. Uh, the the biggest of which is the federal grant that we apply for and, and have applied for each of the last three years. Uh, to, to purchase some Viper handheld radios for our fire departments. Um, that particular grant at a federal level max is at a million, so obviously we can't get the full project under, under that cap, and that's where you see the addition of these others. 
So to carry uh, kind of in line with your email request earlier, what would it take to transition our fire departments to Viper, which is where EMS and law enforcement currently operate. It's the future of communication, all those things we've talked about before. Um, handhelds, you're looking about a million dollars. Mobile radios, which is the radios inside the vehicles themselves, about 700,000. And then because you're adding so many users to the infrastructure, the State Highway Patrol, which manages the Viper network, says, hey, if you do this, if you go full blown in, we're probably going to have to do some infrastructure upgrades. Um, they priced that in 2021 to be between 200 and 300,000. Um, we're assuming it's probably on the higher side now with the cost of equipment uh, increases that we've seen. So we're, we're estimating that to be around $2 million for a full package to carry fire completely to Viper for the purpose of comms back, uh, back and forth. Yeah. Thank you. Well, go ahead. You never mentioned uh, base radios. Does that, is that interest? infrastructure you're talking about include that? So a lot of the stations, of the fire stations have a, a, a base Viper as it is. So when we looked at that, we just looked at taking where the gap was and bringing them, uh, bringing them whole, so to speak. So a lot of our stations already have uh, the, those base radios in place. Okay, and the, the other two is in the jail uh, committee. We have discussed and we've come up with different alternatives and we've got price estimates um, and so I threw these in here, uh, two separate projects, uh, public safety complex 5.5 million uh, which would be the 911 center and sheriff's office and new detention center 22 million uh, which is a 140 bed facility. Uh, here again, Senator Perry is asking us for, you know, potential capital needs. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know a better time to ask when somebody asks, we're working on the state budget, do you have anything on your wish list? Um, so I, th I think we should submit. The question comes is, you know, do we submit all three of these or, uh, I mean, I. You know, last year I think there was two two different uh, prisons or detention centers that were uh, financed. Um, one it one it one of the things that you know is a plus for us is the fact that uh, you know our representative covers uh, another county that has to send their uh, inmates somewhere else. So it's a benefit to our adjoining county. Uh, you know, we're, we're up to the point where we need to do something if we stay in our existing building where the Sheriff's Office and 911 Center is. And I have no idea what it would take to update that facility. But that's kind of on the table right now as, as one of our budget or expansion, not expansion, but uh, trying to update that facility and we've heard some of the engineering problems of trying to raise the floor up in there in order to do something to, you know, the additional bathrooms as it relates to updating. Um, I mean, I, I think all three of these are on the wish list. Uh, and I one that, uh, you know, he's asked, so it's up to us to respond. I mean, the worst thing you can say is no. Sorry. Look with the amount of money that's rolling around up there in Raleigh. These are ARPA funds. These are these these um, funds that Biden just came out with to uh, uh, that Congress that trillion dollar deal, uh, make America great again or whatever it is. Um, it's not that. Why don't you? Why don't you? Uh, why don't you go ahead if, if there's. And the message we got in Washington, D.C. was there's lots of money out there. Don't hesitate to ask for it. Why don't you go ahead and ask for the $2 million for the fire department stuff and fix the whole fire department. And I don't care what you do with the rest of this. I mean, it's not really needed. Uh, I have one item that I want to include in here that costs money indirectly. Uh, but... Uh, we'll deal with these first and then deal wait, with wait, them after this. When I put this together, 
I was trying to remember the numbers, and so that's why I sent it to uh, Chris. So I, I have no problems changing that to uh, two million because you've applied for a grant, but there's no. We've applied for it once before. This, this, this will be the third application third we've made under yeah. under the FEMA grant for for the million dollar max. That would only get us to the handhelds. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think it's I think it's a great list. I mean, even if Mr. Uh, Senator Perry done it, we also got the illustrious Kidwell here that bought twenty million in this county last year. So maybe we can get some money this year. So I think it's a, a, a great list you put together. Well, I I think. As it relates to what Commissioner Richardson said, it would be nice for uh, Brian and Chris to get together and, you know, put the two million in there. And if you need to break it down and strike that two hundred at, at five thousand, part is that okay? Yeah, I you, think so. Just reconfigure it however okay. you want to, and ask for all the money because these people. Uh, the truth be known, the public needs to know, there is so much money out there in the federal system right now that they're trying to give away. Money is literally sloshing around. So ask for, you know, ask for it and, and see what you get. You know, I have a problem with the need for a public safety complex and the need for a detention center other than to improve the one that we have. But if they're giving away free money, Somebody's going to get it. I hate to say that, but it, it's a terrible system. The people that voted this last 1.2 trillion or whatever it was, uh, they 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 have not served us well because they just guaranteed inflation is going to keep right on rolling. Hood, what was your what was your other item? Well, my, my other item is an indirect item. It goes back to what the the resolution that the commissioners passed having to do with. With drugs, and I'll just, I'll just, it's a short paragraph. I'll read therefore. Therefore, be it resolved, the Buffalo County Board of Commissioners endorses efforts to bring justice to the profiteers of illegal drug, of the illegal use of drugs by demanding the North Carolina State Legislature change the laws of the state so that anyone receiving compensation for any kind or transfer of quantity of illegal drugs from one person to another person be sentenced to a minimum 20 years in prison without the opportunity for early release. We need more prisons. Why don't we ask, put in this, ask the state to build a new prison? The DA sat here, stood here and told us that 140-something prisons have been closed down in the last 10 years or so. Let's ask for a drug prison to hold nothing but serious drug offenders. You got a price tag? I mean, we got to put a number on it. Well, 25 million. 25 million? Well, maybe you better put 50 million. Ask for it. But they need to, they do need to improve the prison system in North Carolina. They need more prisons. Do we call that a regional center? Regional, a regional request, five of eight. But for those of you that don't know, when we were in Washington, D.C. during the first uh, uh, early part of February, this was repeated over and over and over again in all the seminars that I was in. That's right. Okay, so we, we've got four items on here. Uh, any Anybody else got one that you want to throw in? Well, I, I mean, I think this is the first time we've actually had a formal request and and we're Putting something in writing. Okay. I'll make a motion that we do these four different uh, items. Got a second. Any further discussion? All the. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at these so called wish list needs. Uh, I can see the radios because that's something we need. That's something we're talking about. But uh, I'm sure we're paying. We would be paying more for them, even with the help from the government, because there's so many people asking for things now. Once again, we have too much money chasing too few goods. But as far as us getting money to build facilities that we don't squarely need, especially at times where. I'm looking at what it would cost to build the uh, the sheriff's office. It would be $525, uh, excuse me, $425,000 
You're going to suck it. $425 oh, a square hold on, foot. Hold on, yeah, five, yeah $425. not $425,000. $425 per square foot. That is just phenomenal What at right now. And I can't, I think what we're doing is we're becoming an accessory to a government that is going to enslave our children for generations if, in fact, our republic, our republic continues to exist. So I don't see how we can, in good conscience, ask for this money sloshing around when we'd be better off asking the federal government to, uh, to take some of it back. Well, just don't vote for us. Now. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's why I'm, that's the premise of my discussion here. I am not going to vote I, I, I understand, Stan, but I, I go back to the trip to uh, D.C. I listen very carefully. The President of the United States stood in front of all of us and said, we are going to use counties to build out our plans for the future of the United States, and we have lots of money to do it. Be innovative in your request. If you don't see something on the list that's approved, ask. Yeah, yeah, but we have a, we have a problem with a president who is pretty. Yeah, yeah, but he's the president is pretty much demented at this point, and he's even saying that he's cut the deficit by 1.7 trillion dollars over the last few years. I'm older than he is. Okay, okay. Yeah, but you're a lot sharper than he is. Let's 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 get back to the, the items on here. Okay, all those in favor of the four items that uh, we've discussed. Uh, sending those to Senator Peary as well as uh, Representative Kidwell. Raise your right hand. Those opposed? Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, and, and based on the conversation we recently had, I sent you all an email about the legislative, since we're talking legislature, um, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, as you all well know, they sent out an email last week has changed their advocacy day. It's a two-day event now, which which y'all seen. Um, so you go up and you're there for an evening with some information, then a dinner with the legislators, and then the next day is a briefing and on to the to the General Assembly to do your lobbying efforts. Um, sent that to all of you so that you would know the evening of May the 23rd conflicts with your current budget workshop schedule. Um, we are we are scheduled to finish to finish discussions on general fund departments and then take up enterprise fund discussions that night. Um, so I got a fee, I got feedback from two commissioners that said I really think we ought to be at the legislative uh, advocacy piece. Um, so whether we do it now or whether we just do it later through email, I need for you to consider how you want us to adjust that because essentially, um, you know, we could push the 23rd to the 25th and then the 25th to the 30th and then add a, add a new meeting on June the 1st. Um, I got feedback from one commissioner that said, I, I hear that, but I'm going to be out of town. You know, based on the original schedule, I'm going to be out of town. Um, we could try to compress one of those budget meetings. Um, we generally try to stay away from Wednesday nights in consideration of uh, Vice Chairman Langley's uh, church events. That no, I'm on Thursday nights. Now. That's on Thursday nights. Now. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Okay, um, so I mean, I just want, I just want, I, I, I sent y'all a note that said I would, I would, I would talk to you a little bit about this. So, however y'all want to handle that, we can do it later. I just want to make sure it was out there. Uh, how many is going to Raleigh or would like to go to Raleigh for the dinner and with the legislatures? So. Commissioner Rebholz had indicated he was in favor of that, so I think Commissioner Walker, you're the only one. Yeah. Oh, you would be okay. So that's seven. Everybody then. Katie, will you will you make reservations? I can. They have not. They haven't said. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't. Yeah, so I'm not sure that there will be, uh, there won't be a host hotel for no, this. It'll kind of be wherever because you'll be meeting at the Quorum Center. I think it's at the Quorum Center. Um, there's, a, there's a Hampton. Yeah, so it'll kind of be wherever uh, we can certainly look okay. kind of close radius to there. The uh, I, I think the round hill, the round Holiday Inn is gone now or getting ready to be gone. So, but, uh, do you do you want to take action on changing? It's fine. I mean, whatever. The, everybody said for 
Everybody said they want to go, so we've got to change it. So sure, yeah, they have to And uh, you say change of the date. There's one commissioner that. Yeah, Commissioner Rebels said he already had planned to be out of, of the county on June the 1st, which is the date you would finalize your, your budget. Um, so we're happy to work through that somehow or another to get a consensus on when it's best for all the commissioners, whether that means compressing a night, whether it means moving a night back. We, we can certainly work through that. We don't have okay. to do that tonight. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we knew where everybody was on it. So Why can't you move it on into the month of June? Uh, I mean, the first, we can. first or second week um, in June, that takes the pressure off everybody. I mean, we, we can certainly do that. We can send some stuff out. I mean, we'll okay. So, okay. I mean, the reason, uh, let me back up. The reason we do that is we try to have it available for your regular meeting in June. Your oh, yeah. regular board meeting in June is when you adopt the final budget. You, and uh, so that's why we try to have it for All the right. first Monday well, in June. I can go either way. It doesn't okay. matter to me. Well, we can work that out. You know, All right. uh, we're happy to work through that. I just I don't want to take any more of your time tonight on that. So okay. thank you. Okay, we're, we're down to our break, so we'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay, we're 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 back from our break, and the next item is Commissioner Richardson notice system for the Register Deeds Office. Yeah, well, I put this on here. I make a motion that we not approve at this time the uh, placing of the uh, additional service from the Register of Deeds uh, to notify people when documents are filed to their account. And what's driving this is you see these articles on television, uh, these advertisements of I could take your, I could own your house tomorrow just by filing one document. They say with the clerk because in most states this, the, those filings are done with the clerk. By making one filing with the clerk, well, it's a big lie. Yeah, it is. It's to sell insurance policies. North Carolina has a very good statute of frauds. You go out and start doing that kind of stuff, you're going to wind up in prison. It's not a matter of getting the house. You're going to get the house, but you're going to get one with bars on it. <laughs> um, and some people have tried that stuff. And forgery, fraud, everything else. Well, the Register of Deeds has come up with the idea that she wants to put, she wants to buy this service and put it online for people that want it in Beaufort County. And what you're going to wind up with is a bunch of nervous Nellies that are going to sign up for this. And then uh, all, you, all that's going to happen is your phone's going to ring right and left. Uh, and, and the second argument that I have against this is we're making government bigger. I, I sit up here, we keep making government bigger. We need to make government smaller. This is an unnecessary uh, this is an unnecessary service, and it's only done to politically enhance the register of deeds. So we shouldn't be doing this uh, at, the, at the county's expense, and uh, it, it's really not a service for our people because we have the law, which is much better than these services that say somebody filed a document, you need to come down here and take care of it. Uh, so uh, my motion, that's my motion. Okay, so we got a second. I asked uh, Carolyn if she would come and give us a status of where the system's at. Would you would you come up and search all the stuff you want to? Can can you give us a status of where we are in this process? Yes, I'd be happy when it, when to. When it was started, uh, this process was started. Um, by the previous register back in May of 2022 is when the contract was signed. Um, there, after going through the file, this was not something I negotiated. The process has already started. $11,100 has already been paid out on this contract. And in about three to four weeks, it should be going live, um, the recording notification. So I've done my due diligence in going back and looking at this and reaching out to other counties that have implemented this program. And you have that before you. But I wasn't called and notified about this ordeal here, so it took me a little time to get it together, but here we are. 
other counties are doing it. Um, I'm not going to say one way or the other because I did not negotiate the contract and I haven't sat down and talked with them. But after talking with the other Register of Deeds across the state with some of their feedback, the citizens seem to be real happy with this. And that's all I can tell you is the feedback that I'm getting. Um, you know, it's a way to help protect uh, their property. Uh, they're getting notifications of filings and they can check and make sure that they're real. Um, what you speak to, I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, you know, here I am. I've been the Register of Deeds since January 3rd. So I'm doing my due diligence and I'm bringing this to you, letting you know where it is and the feedback that I'm getting from other counties. And that's about all I can give you. How many, how many people do you have that's already signed up for it? It hasn't gone live yet. Okay. Okay. And that's the thing. It won't go live. Um, this is a contract that I had to go and I'm getting all the contracts together and trying to manage each and every one. But um, this contract was negotiated by Jennifer Whitehurst. It was not negotiated by me. And um, I don't think that it was any type of tactic on her part. I think that she thought she would be providing a good service to the citizens of Beaufort County and protecting their properties. So that's where I see it. Who, who signed the contract? Jennifer Whitehurst. She doesn't have that authority, does she? She does. How? Why? She's an elected official with... These are Good. these are funds that are restricted funds. They're state automation funds. Um, so she has the register of deeds has access to those funds. Typically, we put about twenty thousand dollars a year in that. It comes from a percentage, the ten, 10 percent of the recordings. It's by statute um, that those funds go into that to be used by the register of deeds to enhance. Uh, their IT footprint to enhance other things. Um, Jennifer, as an elected official, said she thought this was a good project. She brought it and said, I'd like to do that. It was under the purchasing limits, um, so it was her, her ability to do that. So the, the project actually started last fiscal year, um, and she just she was not here to, to complete the project. Was this put in the budget as a separate item? It was not put in the budget as a separate item because it's part of the automation fund. There's twenty thousand dollars that sits in the automation fund that comes to it's state dollars that when people pay when they record things, ten percent of that is put into an automation fund, and that's it, it's restricted funds that the registers of deeds have access to use. Well, let me, let me say this, Mr. Manager, and with, with all due respect to you, and, the re and I'm aiming at the rest of this board, we've had policy after policy in here, and I thought we had a policy that nobody could sign a contract without it coming before the board of, of this type. I'm not aware of any kind of policy like that. If there was something that came before you that required a purchase order, that required the board to issue a purchase order, then we would have the, we, if you took action on it, we'd have the chairman sign it. But if you're talking about every contract we deal with, the board would have to sign that, that, that would be... It, we have limits on contracts, don't we? The uh, $10,000 contract is supposed to come before the board, or we change that? $30,000. $30,000. That's right, and they do. They come either thirty thousand dollars or a multi-year contract that can't be terminated. Um, so if it is a one-year contract that renews, it's okay because it can be terminated. But if it is a three-year contract, like the lease that came, the lease um, that's that was less than the purchasing amount, but it was a three-year term. So that's why it came to y'all. It wouldn't have had to come to you if it was a one-year lease. Well, but is this a one-year commitment? It is one year. It's an annual. You pay an annual fee if you want to continue it. You pay $2,500. So Jennifer said, this is what I want to do. I'm willing to put that in my budget every year out of the automation funds to pay for that $2,500. If you decide right now you don't want to use it, then we would just well, stop. But, but, what, but what you just described is a fund that is out there with one person in control of it. Who holds the money that's in that fund? The, the the fund is a restricted fund that sits in our account. Beaufort County has holds that money. That's right. 
and by legislation, by statute, it is for the use of the Register of Deeds. The Register of Deeds gets to decide what they do with that money. It has to be used for automation and IT enhancement and those kind of things. And the reason the, the reason they did that was because the General Assembly, and it was probably from some lobbying from Registers of Deeds, said counties are not stepping up and doing what they need to do to support us. So the General Assembly put that law in place. I'm not sure this item is quite within what you described. Can you, can you send us a copy of that statute that authorizes this slush fund? Sure. <laughs> motion to approve. No, uh, you got no, a motion no, no. on got, the floor. We got a motion on the floor to... I, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's General Statute 161-13.1. Uh, it requires counties, it's called the AEPF, 10% of the fees collected pursuant to General Statute 16110 retained by the county, um, says is, is to be set aside annually and placed in a non-reverting automation enhancement and preservation accounts. This doesn't sound like automation or preservation to me. That that's I think the, those funds have been misappropriated, and I want the auditors to look at this. That is for the Register of Deeds to decide. I want the auditors to look at this, and would you please send me a copy of that statute? Okay, uh, Commissioner Walker. Yes, um, thank you for putting this together, and, and I'm yes, glad sir. you've got these other counties that have participated. I'm going to vote for this. and. Um, but I would like in a year's time to get some sort of tally as to how many residents. Uh, exactly, and that's what I was looking at and following up with these other counties to see what benchmark, what measure they're using to determine if it's valuable enough to continue their service year after year. Many of them have been like 12 years, 5 years, 6 years. Um, so that would be interesting to find out. I will gauge that for you and bring back that data. Is everybody automatically enrolled or just... No, you have to sign up for okay. it. And um, it seems to me that there was a question too about the liability issue. I, I reached out to the vendor and just to make sure that there's a clause up there that does not hold us accountable in case something happens. But um, it's a notification program. It will notify them if somebody files something in their name. Now they can put in 10 variations of their names. Now Mr. Smith, can you imagine John Smith? Can you imagine how many alerts he's going to get when somebody files something in Beaufort County? But it's designed that way. They can put up to 10 names, you know, also known as, formerly known as, and different things like that. So, Commissioner Booth, and then I'll go. Yes, sir. I think it's a good program. But the question I have with it is, is as you say, people do it voluntarily. How to being notified that that your office is uh, offering once service. well once this goes live they will be notified we will be sending the information out there will be media um, we now have a Facebook page for educational purposes to let know when the office is closing early or different things your holidays and stuff like that just giving general information on marriage license how to apply and different things so we will definitely have um, that advertised. And we'll send it out to all of our uh, county attorneys, and they can reach out to their clients and so on and so forth. It'll be a network. Commissioner Dethridge. Yes, sir. Um, North Carolina's a race state. Okay. Yes, sir. So once you filed them, and you say you own this property, you check, you as a register of deeds are going to mm -hmm. be checking the, uh, the signatures, make sure the notary, make yes, sure sir. everything's right. Once it's filed, the person's in first position owns that piece of property, and they cannot give it up unless they sign a deed, again, with you signing and you know, checking the signatures. I think you're going to be opening yourself to a huge liability because somebody's going to complain. You, who, I got another question. If somebody says they get a notification, who do they contact to uh, find out if it is uh, real or not? Well, first of all, they contact us to make sure that, um, you know, to check and make sure because once that comes to our office for recording, we if everything is there, the notary, the signatures, the stamps and everything, we have to record it, as you stated. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, but if it happens, if they, get, if they get a notification that they've had something to come in, then they will call us. Or they can even go online because everything's online now and see what's being recorded. And then they can contact 
the um, sheriff's office, and they can contact an attorney. So once they know that it's, a, that it's something that has been done that's not right, mm -hmm. someone trying to take their property, their deed, then they make the next step. They contact us, they contact the sheriff's office, and they contact an attorney. Okay, this is going to require that your staff takes extra time to deal with these people on an issue that really can't happen in North Carolina. I, you know, I, I have to concur with Hood. I've, I've never heard of anybody uh, stealing somebody's property by getting some guy over here to say he's this person that owns the property and then selling it. I'm well, and, and I, I understand what you're saying, but things like that do happen. Are they prevalent here in North Carolina? Well, the notary would Maybe not as prevalent. But think about this. The notary would be liable for the entire amount. And we have, believe you me, I've seen notaries come through. And some of them really don't care. When we get something in and the notary has not even signed it or the person's not signed Carolyn. it, but the notary has, sorry. You know, it, it, we see all those things. And notaries are not always up above board. Have you ever, I'm a notary, I've been a notary forever since I was 22. And you don't know how many people approach me to notarize a title, but yet the person that sold them the vehicle's not there, the, the transactors are not there. I won't sign it, I won't notarize. Right. But, but there's a lot of them that will. But, so, but you would be able, you're, you and your staff would be but able to... But they would lose their notary. ...the notary and, and understand whether it's real or not real, right? You know, we have sent they, back they, more this week. We have more trouble with notaries this week than... And it's only Monday. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had to send four back because of notaries. And um, it's not that they intentionally did something. It's just that they skipped a step. And if it's not right, we send, we can't we send it back. But if we have something that comes in and everything's marked, everything's accurate according to our eyes, it gets recorded. Now, I don't know if it's you, Stan Dethridge, or if it's another Stan Dethridge that's pretending to be you or your brother that wants your piece of property. I don't know. All I know is that everything is there and we have to record it by statute. Okay, we've got a motion on the floor and the motion is not to allow the register deeds to install a notice system when documents are recorded and we have a second. All those in favor of that motion raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay. I renew my motion to approve. Well, I don't... I, do we need a motion to approve? Yeah. I mean, I, I would just like to make a note that if you had canceled this contract, it would have costed the taxpayers a few thousand dollars. Well, so. I, I, you know, it's we have we have a lot of people that are moving into this state that are coming from states that mm -hmm. don't have the same. And I agree with what Hood said. I'm trying to. Uh, title companies. There's a lot of title yeah. companies. Yeah. Some that, states are really yeah. strong title yeah. companies. Yeah. Yeah. Just and trying to make money. And understand. And I they understand. can do that. But with our system, I don't think. But because we got people that watch the TV and see the commercial. Yeah. Uh, and we're already into this. I mean, I think I think we need to try it and. You're gonna you're gonna come back to us and tell us whether we need to keep yeah, it. Yeah, I'm not. gonna gauge it by sure. And and if it's not valuable and if it's not credible, you know, I'll be the first one to say, hey, I don't think we should continue this. It's twenty five hundred dollars per year. Once it goes live, we'll pay that twenty five hundred dollars. We'll measure it for a year. I'll come back before you and let you know how many people have signed up for it and how it's played out. And if it's not worth it, I will definitely not do it. Thank you Sorry very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item, uh, Commissioner Richardson, is position and salary review policy. Uh, what this is about is uh, about half the county employees are on what's called a state pay plan, and that means their job descriptions are approved by the state and they're rated uh, 
for wherever they fall within a certain classification system by the state. And what's been happening for the last couple of years is we've, we've been having, we have a situation where someone, a department head, walks in and says, so and so and so and so has been rated by the state as uh, uh, needing a $3,000 raise, or a $3,000 raise will fix their classification within what we're talking about. Well, it sounds, sounded for a long time like the state was doing this, that this was initiated by the state. This is not initiated by the state. What is happening, and I'm going to be crude about this, and you can say I'm a bad boy if you want to, but people are getting raises for county employees, and county employees are getting raises because they have initiated and talked people into changing job descriptions, and then that goes to Raleigh for review. And then Raleigh comes back and says, you misclassified this person, they need to be such and such and such and such. And we've, we're doing probably averaging one a month anyway. And I figured out what was going on because I kept saying, the state doesn't audit our personnel accounts. How does this happen? And it happens because it's initiated by department heads with Beaufort County. And these are three and four and five thousand dollar salary increases. And what I, my motion is this, that the, the, um, the job description change revision has to be approved by the commissioners before it is sent to Raleigh. This gives the commissioners an opportunity to look and see and for us to assure ourselves that the job change is necessary. Because in some of these job descriptions you can change less than one sentence and bump a person up two or three pay grades. And they're doing the same thing they've been doing all along and they were accurately described to begin with. So I want, I want all future state uh, uh, approved uh, classifications to originate with the county commissioners before they go to Raleigh. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about uh, these casual reviews that are done. That's my motion. Is there a second? Uh, discussions, questions, Brian. Yes, sir. So, um, so for everybody to clearly understand, and, and I would take exception to the comment that our department heads are intentionally trying to get people raises. Um, this is only for uh, employees who are covered under state personnel act. So that those are health department employees and DSS employees, um, and under the administrative code. Uh, the Office of State Personnel is responsible for classifying those and making sure they are in the right category. Whether that's a public health nurse too, that's doing certain things and then they change and they're doing additional things, then that information is sent to OSHR, they look at it, they have someone who looks at that under the state classifications and says, yes, if they're doing that work, they should be classified as a public health nurse three. That comes back to us, we bring it to the board and say, based on that, it falls in this category in your pay and classification plan. The, the idea that we simply decide we want to help a buddy, as Commissioner Richardson occasionally says, is, what I um, said. is, is absolutely incorrect. Um, no, it's we not. are doing what we are required to do, the department heads, the director of DSS, the director of the health department, who work for boards, are doing what they are required to do under the State Personnel Act. And that is, if those jobs change, they are required to send them for review. Um, the state makes the determination on that. And to, and, and to say that every time it happens, that's not true. When we've sent them up before and, and OSHR said, no, that shouldn't change, that, that, that's fine. But they are the authority. We are not a substantially equivalent county. If we were a substantially equivalent county, and there are only three or four of those across the state, the Mecklenburgs, the Wakes, those folks who have large enough HR departments where they do the scrutiny and the state has signed off and said, we no longer handle that function, county, you've got enough infrastructure in place, you handle it. We are not substantially equivalent. 
So by administrative code, we are required to send those to them for them to look at. Now when it comes back and it says, yes, it ought to be a whatever thing, then based on your pay and classification plan, you should do that. That's appropriate. Otherwise, in my conversation with Drake Maynard, who's an attorney and used to run OSHR, um, he said, I would be very careful about monkeying around with state administrative code. He said, because you risk the jeopardy of losing federal funding, and that's why this is all in place. So, um, first of all, we don't do it just to help get a buddy a raise, so I want that to be clear. Um, we're doing it because it's required to be done, and the state is the one who has the authority to do those things. And if we were not sending them, then we're doing a disservice to the people who are working for us, and we ought to do it the right way. So, Mr. Commissioner B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Manager, before, we also heard that it's a, a whole lot of people that, that's doing it. How many, I know you might not have the numbers today, but it's a very few people it's on the state personnel act on the, at DSS, and it's a very few that's at uh, the health department. Is that correct? So everybody who works at the health department and everybody who works at DSS are under the state personnel policy. But some of them county, uh, they spend a portion of their salary. Is that correct? Well, they are quasi-state employees, so they're, they fall under state personnel. So if there is in our personnel policy, that, like one of the things is on a, on a disciplinary matter, if you work for DSS or you work for health, then you get an additional appeal to the administrative office of the course. Um, so there's certain things under the state administrative code that because we are providing that service for the state, health and, D and social services, we are required to play by their rules. And that's one of the rules. They set the classifications, they approve the changes in classifications. That's not approved at the local level. So we can't take them with their classifications. That's right. We send it to them. They look at it. They say yes or no. And they, they say no. I think Janelle's had three maybe over the last six months, last year. I, I don't remember. They're, they're not that often. Um, DSS has probably had a couple or three. I, I wouldn't want to put a number, but, but they're not. It's not like it happens every other week. You know, the, the insinuation that we do it every month is not correct. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Let me go back. I'm not trying to thwart, thwart the State Personnel Policy Act. I'm simply asking for a change in procedure. And that procedure is that this come by this board because if we're changing duties of employees that much in these departments and we're reclassifying employees, commissioners need to know it. We need to know something about what's going on in these departments. And it needs to come to the commissioners and let us peruse it and come to some kind of terms about what is done with it. And I understand we, we do not want to get in the way of the administration of the State Personnel Act. By the same token, it's awful easy for a supervisor to say, I'm asking for you to be reclassified. Maybe they're knowing that employee's not going to be reclassified, but it sure looks good. It makes the employee feel good. There's a lot of things going on here. And these commissioners need to, need to have a better handle on what's going on with personnel and these personnel raises. Because uh, it's quite possible when you start looking at this, and we've looked at some of this in the past, that we find out that everybody's all of a sudden going to be a chief and they're going, not going to be any Indians. So we need to, uh, we need to, we, this, I'm just asking for a change in, in the, the procedure. Let it come by here before it goes to Raleigh. Call the police. Okay. All those in favor of uh, the motion to change the policy to where it has to come before the Board of Commissioners for approval before it goes to the state personnel. Well, I didn't necessarily say for approval. It's not for approval. That's not what I'm saying. It comes by here for review before it goes to Raleigh. Because, again, I'll point out to you, in the past we've had situations where we found out we had three or four people with the same classification, but there was only one job available. Uh, stuff like this happens, and it goes on from time to time, and within the organizations of departments, they can become strained with this policy. Approval is not in there. The request comes to the Board of Commissioners for review before it goes to Raleigh. 
So, Mr. Chairman, I'll read to you the information. Commissioner Richardson would like the board to set a policy that all requests for position or salary review under the state plan are to be approved by the Board of Commissioners before being sent to the state. That's his agenda item. Well, that's the title of the agenda item, but with the information that I've gathered here tonight, I certainly have the ability to change my request, which I did. Okay. You understand the motion. Those in favor of changing this policy, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Okay, we're down to the next item, stormwater rules update. Mr. Richardson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I mean, Mr. Manager, do you know when the nutrient stormwater rules are going to uh, be uh, take effect for both counties? I do, yes, sir. We had a meeting the other day with uh, Trish uh, D'Arconte uh, with the NC, uh, DEQ Nonpoint Source Planning Unit. Um, she said that the timeline for this, because there are 10 additional local governments that were added, mostly municipalities, uh, May of 2023 is when this would go to the Water Quality Committee. And then if it gets through the Water Quality Committee, then it's anticipated it would go to the EMC in July of 23. If that were to occur and the EMC were to approve it in July of 23, then local governments would have six months to adopt the policy. So she said if everything worked perfectly, the absolute earliest it could occur would be November 1 of 23, but most likely it would be the first quarter, January or later, of 2024. Uh, and just to be clear, these, uh, these regulations were adopted by the legislature, or was that enabling legislation adopted by the legislature? My understanding was, I mean, this occurred back in 2000, um, the, um, actually even earlier than that, I think, when it started. This was based on um, federal regulations um, that came down. Uh, there were evidently a lot of fish kills and a lot of algae blooms, uh, and then the General Assembly put that rule in place and, and tasked um, DEQ uh, Deaner at the time with putting in rules. So it goes through uh, Deaner and then it, it evidently follows this process with the, the EMC to put the rules in place. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, it has to be readopted by statute. Uh, DEQ has to readopt it every 10 years per legislation. So the rules that were adopted by this board in 2004, which were the TARPAM uh, nutrient rules that were the model ordinance, um, are now due up because Diener is required to readopt those every 10 years per legislation. Okay, but but the the the, the there's federal red legislation having to do with the TARPAM rules. Uh, I thought that was an invention of the state. I think it was, well, my understanding, and, and um, I was looking for some information on that because I thought it was listed. I thought I had that at one time. Um, it came out of some of the federal clean water rules that got pushed down years and years ago that told the states you need to, you need to put regulations in place to keep the waters clean. So it went back to federal Clean Water Act. Well, but that's specific to the Clean Water Act. That's not specific to the Tar Pamlico Basin. These rules were generated by the legislature for the Tar Pamlico uh, Basin. Right, plus the noose and other areas. But it was my understanding is it was driven by the federal government saying Clean Water Act says you have to look after these things, and they pushed it down to the to state to say you're not complying with what you need to, so the state put rules in place. Now, I, I may be wrong. I mean, well, try this out and see how this fits. What started this was was that the that there were certain uh, uh, sewage processing plants on the Tar Pam that could not meet the effluent standards, and it didn't look like they were going to meet them anytime soon. So a a 
regional or an area, a basin area thing was put together that involved uh, cities and counties and towns so that they could do some averaging of these effluent rules, which meant that one plant might be exceeding the rules and another plant may be well under, so you can average this thing all out, and as long as everybody's under average, then, uh, then everybody is approved. And in order to make that work, they had to have all of these municipalities, they put all of these, they didn't have to have, they put all of these municipalities into these nutrient rules to reduce the nutrient effluent of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, into the uh, river basin. And they did the same thing in the news, and I don't know, they may have done it one other place in the state of North Carolina. But uh, now, my, one of my questions, this, this thing comes as a great surprise to me because uh, these rules of tra are, cha are changing drastically from what they were before. So my question is, we're coming into this kind of late. Have we had a review of, of these rules by the commissioners, or is this something that's going to be put in the commissioners when we're going to get one of those speeches of you have no choice but to approve this? So, um, so I would push back a little bit on that these are extremely different rules. Um, and what I can tell you is that in November 1st of 2004, the board adopted um, stormwater rules that were based on the model ordinance that the state put together, which is exactly what this new uh, readoption requires you to do. Um, and and in that, I, I, I was not here at the last meeting, but I, I do remember you making a couple of comments. Uh, one of those was that Beaufort County was the only county in this rule. Um, that, that is not true. Um, every, every county in the Tarpan Basin is included in this. Um, Pitt County is in it? Yes, sir. Um, in fact, here's the Tar Pamlico Nutrient Strategy Fact Sheet. It says, Beaufort, Dare, Edgecombe, Franklin, Granville, Halifax, Hyde, Martin, Nash, Person, Pitt, Vance, Warren, Washington, and Wilson counties are included. Now, they just added that in this new they, round of rules. They, they did. They added Yeah, I see. Wait, 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 wait. Up until they now, added, there was only one county in it, and that was Beaufort. No, sir. Um, in November the 1st of 2004, is I, I have the, the policy that was adopted by this board. Uh, I have the minutes. And of those minutes, the stormwater ordinance, there was a motion by Commissioner Moore, seconded by Commissioner Richardson, and the board voted unanimously adopting this. And in this ordinance, it shows the affected local governments, the municipalities of Greenville, Henderson, Oxford, Rocky Mount, Tarboro, Washington, and the counties, Beaufort, Edgecombe, Franklin, Nash, and Pitt. So there have always been more counties in this. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware uh, of that. There are a couple of things. Yes, sir. Um, and there was a comment made that this hotline was something that was new and oppressive. Uh, in your ordinance that was adopted in 2004, it says preventing discharges and establishing a hotline. It also talks about education program. So the change that occurred that has a lot of people torn out of the frame, I think, is the 40 is the 24 percent comment that. Um, Anything, if you just, if you, anything more than 24% um, build upon causes this to engage. According to the state, Beaufort County has been under the coastal stormwater regulations since forever. And the coastal stormwater regulations have always said 24% built upon area. No, they haven't always said that. Uh, well, that's not what the state of North Carolina says. Well, I may have told you that, but I was in the legislature. I went to the legislature. If the I last finish. time the stormwater rules were changed, I was sitting in the legislature. If and I, it was changed from 30% to 24%. If I could finish. Um, according to Trish De, De Argante, who is with Diener, she said that the reason the state took the 24% for the stormwater nutrient rules is they wanted to make it match the existing rules, the existing coastal stormwater rules. So there would be no confusion in that. So that that is the same according to the state. Um, the other piece of this is that what she said to us on the phone call, and Mr. Buck was on the phone call as well, she said, I would dare believe that there's many times this would impact people in your county. She said mostly it becomes issues with failing septic systems. 
on page three of the proposed ordinance, which was this, which was under this as well, single family and duplex residential and related recreational development and expansion development that, that disturbs less than one acre is exempt from all the provisions of this ordinance. So I asked the question because I think I recall at the last meeting, although I wasn't here, I think your example was there's some very small lots in Beaufort County. So if I'm on the river and I have a small lot, like a half acre lot, and I put my house on and I put a shed and I put my driveway, then I'm all of a sudden over 24% and I'm, I'm stuck with this. So I presented that to her and she said, it's less than, you've disturbed less than an acre. It doesn't apply. So I, I, there's a lot of exceptions. What about here. subdivisions that have these? Subdivisions, according to her, if, if you have a plat that's in a subdivision, then the whole subdivision is subject to that, which it probably should be because you're doing a lot of impact in an area, so you, if you're having runoff. Um, so yes, um, according to that, and there is, there's, there is an exception in there. Um, so the 24% talks about commercial, industrial, institutional, multifamily, residential, or local government development that disturbs less than a half an acre and expands existing structures on a parcel but does not result in a cumulative built on an area of 24%, then you're exempt. And anything above that, you've got to comply with stormwater rules, which just means you've got to contain the stormwater. As I, I mean, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but my understanding is you got to contain it, you got to hold it the first, the first one hour, or first 24 hour, however that works, to hold it, so it so the nutrients can settle out before it runs off into the, into the river so that we don't have issues. But, but this is pretty much, um, the, the thing they did do, they lowered, the, the, the nitrogen is the same from the last rule, they lowered the phosphorus, they cut the phosphorus in half. Um, but generally, my understanding is that it's basically the same. But I mean, I, I, I defer to the, the planners um, who help do this. But every one of these have been the model ordinance, the bare minimum that has been required by the state. Um, and and the, the motion at the last meeting to send that to our legislative delegation to ask them to get us exemption from that has been done. Both of those legislators, our representative and our senator, have both acknowledged that and said they are looking at it and working on it. Well, the, the ordinance that we're under right now, here's what I'm hearing. There, how was that enforced? Who enforced that? Who went out and beat people with a stick and made them get in line? Well, I'm not sure we really have done what we're supposed to do over it. Um, there, are, there are some things. Um, I mean, I, I, that may have been a too broad a statement. Um, I, I think we're we're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, I think a lot of it is incumbent upon um, engineers and land surveyors to to let their clients know when they trigger these rules and to make sure that occurs under these rules appropriately. Um, we do have. Um, under the old, under the existing ordinance, there there is um, regulations where we, if we are notified of something, we're supposed to go look at it and inspect it to see if it meets what it's supposed to do and if it's in accordance with the rules. Um, so we take that responsibility um, based on this existing ordinance. And my understanding is it's it's generally about the same with the new revision. My understanding is because the enforcement has been so lax on these rules that there's going to be some tough enforcement provisions in these new rules. Do you know anything about that? I do not. I'd have to, I'd have to defer to the planner to ask that question, but my understanding is they're generally, I mean, I, I don't know, Brian, they're, they're generally the same. I mean, it, it has the explicit, illicit discharge where folks can call. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of stuff is the same. I mean, should, are there things we probably should have been doing over the years? Probably so, um, but, but I can't speak to that. And back again, you know, the, the failing septic, it's my apologies, guys, Brian Buck, Committee's Commission. Uh, the failing uh, septic issue, Commissioner Richardson, has been one of the, the big issues. Um, you know, you drive by your neighbor's house or drive by a subdivision, you see septic spewing here and there. Those are issues that, you know, have primarily cropped up. Given the development throughout Beaufort County over the past many years, a lot of these aren't triggered where we don't have to follow through with these. And, and basically, um, as Brian mentioned, Beaufort County is also subject to the coastal stormwater rules, which are above and beyond. You're aware of that. Um, and, you know, it, it, 
also the tar pam uh, new development storm order because of the 2020 tar pam rule changes the built upon area threshold at which stormwater treatment is required that's the 24 percent built upon area uh, is the same for the coastal stormwater as i just mentioned um, the new tar pam rules completely exempt new residential development as brian was saying on isolated lots with proposed built upon area of less than five percent as well as new residential development with disturbing less than one acre land you know you said five percent i think you meant to say something else less than five built upon area less than five percent as well as new residential developments with built upon of less than five percent correct the new tar pam rules completely exempt New residential development on isolated lots with proposed built upon area less than 5%. But 5% but of an acre lot is a house, is less than a house. Right. Well, and that's less than 5% is, is exempt. Uh, as well as new residential development with less than one acre of disturbance. Okay, with the exception of lots in the subdivision, as we had just mentioned. Well, if it's a planned subdivision, then of course the whole subdivision has to participate. You're bringing me around to my with main under point that. in this, and that is, commissioners should have been informed of this a long time ago when we were starting this, so that we could have a at least a committee of commissioners, or commissioners would have had an opportunity to comment on certain provisions of this. Now, my understanding is. Who's approved this and sent this on to the state and said everything's okay? Right. Our, our organization was brought in to assist the county. Right, um, our consultants. We're your consultant. We were brought in to assist the county with bringing, in, with bringing them into compliance with these new stormwater regulations. That's what we've done. We took the, the minor, minor details of these requirements, all right, we didn't add anything additional. We took the bare bones minimum and submitted the new version you submitted to the it. state. You submitted it. On behalf state. of the county. But did you bring it to the county for review? We coordinated with the county before well, who this in the was brought forward. the county making these decisions? So, so let's explain that. The state said to us, send us your model ordinance let us review it first, then it can then it goes back to your boards for consideration. So we're doing what the state told us to do, and that was send it to them first to make sure that it's correct based on the model and then come back to it. So you'll see every one of these says draft, not approved by the Board of Commissioners. So we that, that's exactly right. It well, what, hasn't come to you. What's going to happen is we're going to be handed an ordinance and said you have no choice but to approve this ordinance. Now, there's some negotiation that can be done in this that might help the county and might help development. And here's what I'm concerned about. This thing has gone off and it's gone through the bureaucracy with the hired help and everybody's out there just doing what the state told them to do and you dumb commissioners all you got to do is sign this thing when we bring it to you i've got a real serious problem with the fact that this thing was not brought to the commissioners it's legislation it's law we make the decisions this should have been brought to us long before now for review so what i'm what i'm asking for is an opportunity for us to review this since this is stretched out six months and see if there are not some changes that can be made in it. And Mr. Manager, let me inform you of one thing. The last time the state stormwater rule was, was a, uh, a pass that, uh, for Beaufort County in eastern North Carolina, Beaufort County took the lead in getting that law changed. Beaufort County took the lead and we got some serious things that we wanted and we needed in there. Yes, the state took advantage of us in a few places because when you're writing legislation at the last minute, all they do is change a number or two. So I know how that works. Been right there. So we need to review this stuff to be sure what's going on in Beaufort County because we could have to hire more personnel because of this thing if the state decides to severely enforce it. And the other question I want to know is enabling legislation, has it been changed so that the state has more authority to force us to do things? Because right now there's not much teeth in the present law that we're under at the moment. These are questions that need to be answered. So, so I've heard that clearly, Commissioner Richardson, and, and you receive all the legislative updates that I receive. 
Um, I will tell you that there was a public hearing and public comment period on this. The official rulemaking process began in January of 19 when the division staff presented the draft rules to the EMC and received the commission's approval to make, it, make the draft rules available for public, public comment. Notice of text for public hearings and comment was published in the North Carolina Administrative Hearings website on February 15th and 19 and distributed through the DW, DWR stakeholders list. Then a 60-day public comment period was open from the 15th, the day they noticed it, until April the 6th of 19. And there were two public hearings held in March of 19. One was in Lenore Community College in Kinston, and one was in Clayton, at Clayton Town Hall in Clayton. I went back and looked through every one of my emails, and I keep all my emails. Um, I never saw notice of that. But it, you know, if I miss the notice of it, I'm sorry. But you, you receive those notices just like I do. So I, I, I'll take the hit on that. But if, if you're saying that um, there were all these changes that were made, there's not any difference, there's not any substantial difference from the old rules to the new rules. So. In fact, I think they've made it a little easier. They well, took out the calculations. It used to be under the old rule or the existing rule that there was a ton of calculations you had to do to try to figure out the nutrient loading. That's been taken out, and, they, and they're just looking at the area, the built-upon area, and with the exceptions. So, um, so I'm happy to take whatever whatever slings and arrows that, that you want to throw. Um, but but we tried to do this the way the state asked us to do it, and, and um, yeah. But Mr. Manager, that's not your job to work for the state. Yeah, no, your job is to work for this board and it, for Beaufort County. You're right. It's not my job to work for the state, but it is my job to obey the law. You, you've got no law to obey yet because none's been passed. We're forming a law. You are not. The state has given you the draft ordinance that says this is what you, what you must comply with. If you want to make it stricter, you can, but it is the model ordinance, and this model ordinance has been the minimum from day one, and we always go by the minimum. Well, let's go back to legislation that's out there that affects Beaufort County. You sort of painted a picture there that somehow, as a commissioner, I, I'm supposed to review all the state stuff and, and keep up to speed on all that. That's what we're paying you for. Okay? So, I, and, and, and that is part of what I try to do, Commissioner Richardson, but I can't track every piece of legislation that goes through the General Assembly. Well, the, one of the things that we had before, when Beaufort County took the lead, went to the state, went to Raleigh, because I was the lead agent for Beaufort County, I was there, okay, was that we had a lobbyist in Raleigh who helped us with this a great deal. And the board has chosen to do away with our lobbyist. We need you fired him a long time before he died. Let's get the facts in this thing straight. We need to take a look in our upcoming budget at how we're going to review these items because these are serious things that affect the people of Beaufort County. They are lobbyable, and we need to be on top of the issues that affect us, and we're not. This one has, well, it's essentially gotten bias, and what it comes down to at this point in time is Hood Richardson is going to be doing something as Beaufort County Commissioner that he shouldn't have to be doing, and that is reviewing a bunch of legislation and a bunch of regulations and then coming back to this board to see if we can get these things changed. You know, uh, I do these permits. I am very familiar with what we're doing now. I have done a bunch of these permits, not just one. Gentlemen, can we bring this one to a close? We need to. Well, okay, I'll bring it to a close with one statement. In the future, I'm looking to the managers to do the screening to bring the legislative issues that affect the people of Beaufort County uh, that are important. And I understand what you're saying. There's 14 million things going on up there in Raleigh. And I appreciate that. But the things that pop out, you need to bring them to us. And if it is an insurmountable job. This board needs to take a look at how we're going to solve this problem when we do this budget. Whether it is by hiring a lobbyist or whether there's a screening outfit in Raleigh that provides sensitive information. We've got an association of county commissioners, but they, they respond to what the membership wants. I understand that. But we've got a problem and we need to take a look at it. I don't want to see any more legislation passed in Raleigh that affects us that we don't have our fingers into. 
And if you have people that are experts in these situations, you need to use them. You want to go to the town of Bath Sewer expansion? Well, I think the manager, think the manager can just give us a report. We were both in a meeting, and, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not that bad right now. Thank you. If it works out as it was described in that meeting, uh, do you want to do that, Mr. Manager? Uh, so on February the 16th, we had a meeting uh, with Bubs Carson, Jonathan Russell, Hope Woolard with the city, Blaine Humphreys with Rivers and Associates, who's the engineer of record, Commissioner Richardson, Commissioner Repulse, and myself. Uh, at that meeting, which was held over at the city, they explained the project that was coming from Bath, the forced main sewer that was coming from Bath, coming into the city of Washington. And I believe they, they, the meeting started with what was the size of the forced main. I think the forced main was six inches. And Commissioner Richardson said that was fine with him, that was enough. Um, it was big enough to do whatever they needed to do. Out of that meeting, the city agreed that they would look at any, on a case-by-case -case basis, they would be happy to look at folks who may want to attach to that force main, um, but that that would be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So that is where that that is where that stands. It is, it is like I say, it's not our project, but they are willing to, uh, to look at entities or people, um, but it is a pretty high bar uh, to attach to a force main, um, and there's a lot of expense associated with it. But they said they would be willing to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis and not completely rule it out. The, the newspaper article said on the front page that they had received $20 million, but when you went to page 5 and read the details, they got $9.8 million. I don't... Yeah, I, I'm not sure all the ins and outs. There's several pots of money. I think they had some money that got appropriated a couple, three years ago. That was five million. That I never think. got spent. That they were holding on to. There was some additional appropriation. I, I don't know all the ins and outs. So then you might have been nine point eight million. Yeah. All right, uh, Commissioner Dethridge, state supported school choice. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the night is growing long. I would like to bring this up at another time, both issues, without objection. Okay. We can uh, do this at another time. Go ahead and adjourn. Thank you. Well, well we got we got one more. We got to allow commissioner's comments. Yes. Is right. there anyone? I have comments. On the item having to do with uh, uh, the closed session, which involves narcotics, and this board's protection of the drug industry in Beaufort County, and yes, I'm accusing you. Uh, I want to say this. Neither the county attorney nor the county manager has the authority to remove an item that any commissioner puts on the agenda. The proper procedure is for that item to be debated by the board and the board to vote to accept it or remove it. And no, that's what you did after the fact. If I hadn't raised the issue, it would never have been an issue, Ed. If you don't mind, stop mumbling. So, I ain't mumbling. I just, you, you are mumbling. Yes, you are. Now you, you, my, might, you might scare some people, but it's going to scare you. You're mumbling. My, my, uh, this is, this, doing this, taking an item, refusing to post an item that any commissioner puts on the agenda is a violation of our free speech rights as a commissioner and our rights as a commissioner. And it should never happen again. Can I use my two minutes? You sure can. I don't, I'm, I'm against this here. But Mr. Richardson, he, he thinks he's the only commissioner. The only rule up here is that if we could learn you how to count. It's four is the majority. You and Spain can't run this whole board. You can't tell us what to do. We are not your children. And the sooner you get in through your thick skull, you, the better off you will be as a commissioner. Thank you. Going to adjourn. Is there a second? Yeah. Second. All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand.